Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to New Pit to this uh, uh, Military Power Seminar 2020, this year in a fully digital format. The topic is uh, transatlantic security relations after the US presidential elections. What to expect? This is the 22nd Military Power Seminar. And it brings together a wide vari variety of high level experts and officials from across the transatlantic community. And uh, today we have a great set of global leading thinkers. And in the first panel, we have uh, Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger, the chairman and the leader of the Munich Security Conference. And we are joined also by Ian Brzezinski. So we could not have been as, uh, asking for better people. And we also have a great audience. Uh, I think many hundreds or, or even thousand people have signed up to this uh, meeting. Uh, and it's a big audience and you, all of you can, of course, participate in the discussion by sending questions in the chat functions. Uh, so please uh, start doing that and you can do that already now. Uh, the event starts with an overlook of the strategic picture as seen from the US and Europe. It then moves on to European security developments and responses. And this will be a discussion led by Natalie Tocci who is a special advisor to the EU high-level representative Joseph Borrell, and she's also the president of our sister institute in Italy. And then we'll move, uh, and she's joined also by Sofia Besch. And towards the end, we zoom in on some of the implications for Norwegian security and defense. So I think it will be an exciting day. Uh, please stay tuned and, and, uh, and uh, uh, engage yourself in the discussion. But before we start, let me give the floor to Tune Skogan, the State Secretary in the Ministry of Defence, for some opening remarks. Please, Tune, the floor is yours. Dear friends, it is an honour to open the 22nd Military Power Seminar. Amidst a global pandemic, issues of security and resilience are becoming more important. Our interconnected world continues to reduce the separation between civil society and the military. I would therefore like to thank the Norwegian Foreign Affairs Institute for organizing and hosting this seminar. We have witnessed a polarizing election cycle in the United States. Deep divisions have been exposed and emotions are running high. Some even speak of a decay in NATO's transatlantic ties. However, let me be clear, our alliance stands firm. The United States' commitment is strong, Europe's investment is increasing, and mounting security concerns have demonstrated the relevance of NATO. Europe and the United States may at times disagree, but our bond goes far deeper than party politics. It is an alliance based on shared values forged in geostrategic pragmatism. Two world wars demonstrated Europe's need for protection against itself. The Soviet Union demonstrated America's need for protection in Europe. Based on democracy, liberty, and the rule of law, NATO's commitment to collective defense has ensured our security for more than 70 years. Today, the threats we face are more multifaceted and the world more unpredictable. COVID-19 has changed our lives in the ways we could not imagine but also intensified global tensions. The rise of China has brought millions out of poverty, but furnished an increasingly assertive communist party with great power. Oil prices have fallen, but Russia has continued its military buildup and confrontational foreign policy. New technology is providing new opportunities but also new vulnerabilities. In this demanding environment, 
Europe still needs stability through continued cooperation and an alliance across the Atlantic. The United States still needs its allies. We need a strong NATO and we all have to contribute. The burden is becoming greater than either continent can carry on its own. In response, Norway has steadily increased its contribution and increased spending on defense. Our recently published long-term defense plan sets out to do even more. We will strengthen Brigade North with a fully mechanized battalion, acquire long-range precision strike capabilities, and buy new main battle tanks. Finnmark Land Command is established, and we will continue our modernization of the Home Guard. We will further acquire new helicopters and strengthen our special forces with an additional maritime special operation task group. Our commitment to situational awareness will be expanded with the new P-8 Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft that are scheduled to arrive in 2022. We are ready to do more but we remain dependent on Allied support. The last decade has seen a stronger and much more assertive Russia. The illegal annexation of Ukraine and its involvement in Syria serve as dramatic examples. In addition, Russian activity in the North Atlantic has increased considerably. The Northern Fleet is exercising more often along the Norwegian coast and increasing its ability to disrupt Allied reinforcements to Europe. A new generation of submarines and hypersonic missiles threaten NATO's freedom of action. Neither Norway nor America can handle these challenges alone. The Atlantic is too vast and the missiles too fast. Norway will do its part by providing situational awareness and reassuring Russia of our peaceful intentions. We remain committed to reducing tensions by maintaining transparency about allied training and presence in the high north. However, Europe must also rely more on itself. As China's influence increases, the United States will have to focus more on the Pacific and Asia. This means that Europe must continue to increase its military capabilities and defense spending. It is also vital that Europe is able to increase its return on investments. We are a patchwork of nations with common ideals. We have strength in numbers and in resources. However, to capitalize on our advantages, we must exploit economies of scale and unify our course of action. As technology and foreign investment present us with new challenges, we must find common solutions. We must utilize the political tool NATO was intended to be, to discuss differences and share best practices. Norway is therefore working hard to support various initiatives complementing this effort within NATO. We are improving NATO's readiness through the Joint Expeditionary Force, as well as further increasing our defense cooperation with Sweden and Finland. Norway's hopes for the future are therefore more independent of the election than the title of today's seminar might indicate. 
Whatever the administration, we are confident that both our alliance and the threats against it will persist. While harsh words may dominate our screens, we have a long-standing and solid relationship with the United States on security and defense issues. In addition, we see the United States engagement in the security of Europe and in an alliance with a renewed sense of purpose. That does not mean that our relationship is without difficulties. Family relations seldom are. Words that spread doubt about democracy are not useful to an alliance built on democratic values, nor are surprise announcements that create confusion or divert from agreed policy. These are issues that we have to work on. At the same time, our opponents are growing stronger and technology is stretching our resources into new domains. Safeguarding our security has thus become more demanding. In the end, the transatlantic link remains essential for our common security, not just because the balance of power increasingly dictates it, but because of our shared values. Thank you, and I wish you all the best for a very successful seminar. Okay, thank you so much to Tune Skoga. Uh, some of us had a bit of difficulties on the sound here, but uh, but uh, um, thanks to her. Now we move on to our panel with, uh, as I said, uh, two excellent speakers, uh, Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger uh, and Ian Brzezinski, who is the the, uh, uh, at the Atlantic Council and the, and the School Group Center for Strat uh, Strategy and Security. It's a senior fellow. And of course, both of these two gentlemen are uh, uh, well experienced uh, experts and maybe the best ones we can have to reflect on uh, the title of this panel, the strategic picture. What would be the next four years? I would like now to, to give the floor first to Ambassador Ischinger. Uh, and then we move on to Ian, and then we open up for a general discussion. So first to uh, uh, Ambassador Ischinger, thank you so much for joining us. And let me also thank you so much for your dedication and support of the, the NUP and Wilson Center uh, cooperation together with the Munich uh, Security Conference on the Arctic Security Roundtable. Um, I think it was in 2018, the winter of 2018, at the München Security Conference, uh, Vice President uh, Joe Biden had the speech. Uh, I remember I was sitting there in the, in the room and uh, it was a night owl session, I think. And one of the things Joe Biden said, he said, we will be back, he said. And now he's back as uh, the president of the U.S. Uh, so, uh, what would be the next? What will the next four years bring, Wolfgang Ischinger? Please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ulf. I hope everybody can hear me. Is the sound okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much for inviting me together with my good old friend Ian. Uh, and and I'm I'm delighted to participate in this uh, discussion about the next four years about the the future for the transatlantic community after the um, recent elections in the United States. As you just said, uh, the president elect announced in Munich, uh, we will be back. Now he will be back. Um, and my the first point I want to make is that I. Uh, I've seen a lot of enthusiasm um, among political classes uh, here in Europe, um, uh, in the media, in opinion pieces. And of course, you know, at first glance, that's fine. But my advice, my advice would be curb your enthusiasm. 
it is not going to be some kind of uh, you know, unrealistic transatlantic paradise that we are going to be looking at. Uh, the issues of the transatlantic that, that have uh, been uh, keeping us busy in the transatlantic discussions and, and, and conflicts even, tensions, these issues will not automatically go away just because somebody else is sitting, uh, uh, is going to be sitting in the White House. But, but, uh, of course, uh, in German, we say der Ton macht die Musik, the tone makes the music, and the tone will change. And with the tone come the th what I call the three T's, truth, trust, and transparency. And this is, you know, essential for the conduct um, of a, um, uh, and, and, and the degree of cooperation in uh, uh, across the Atlantic. Um, trust uh, has over the last four years largely disappeared. Truth has become questionable. Uh, what is truth? Uh, can we rely that our, can we be certain that our leaders tell us the truth? Big question mark. And of course, also transparency has gone down the drain to a certain extent. I think in all three categories, we will be looking at the uh, at uh, uh, at a, uh, a new period of a of, revi of revitalized truth, trust, and transparency. And that, of course, uh, is more than just a change of tone. It means a whole new all game, hopefully. Let me, in the few minutes you've given me, let me just uh, highlight a couple of points where I think uh, there will be uh, policy differences uh, coming from the uh, Biden, future Biden administration that really matter. Well, let me start with what our publics uh, are most interested in, um, the environment, climate, and the announcement that a Biden administration would want to rejoin the Paris climate deal is, of course, of huge public significance. Second, uh, arms control, uh, one of my favorite, uh, uh, you know, uh, issues. Arms control came to a grinding halt. Uh, now that uh, obviously is not necessarily the fault of the United States uh, because of Russian violations. Uh, of, uh, of existing arms control agreements, but we can expect, and I would want to expect, a, a, a renewed effort by a Biden administration to work with allies and, and, and to start negotiate, negotiating with Russia and with others, with Russia, of course, certainly about the extension of the New START agreement. That would be a great beginning. And, and let me... Uh, um, uh, let me add two more points and then and then uh, come to a, a stop. China. I think China is going to be probably the number one long term transatlantic challenge. We we in Europe do not yet have an agreed comprehensive EU China strategy. Um, there is, as I see, uh, significant on this issue, significant bipartisan support for a tough policy on China. As Joe Biden himself has said in the campaign, I will be tough on China. So figuring out a way not to get into each other's hair uh, over China, to coordinate wherever possible our approaches, our policy approaches to China, I think that is going to be key and I expect the Biden administration to be open to uh, uh, very senior level transatlantic discussions about China. And the very last point, uh, and I don't want to, you know, mince my words, uh, about Nord Stream 2, which has been such a divisive issue within Europe, but certainly between Germany and, 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 um, uh, and the United States. I would hope that we could take a look at a, what I would call, a Euro-Atlantic or a transatlantic energy security compact. 
where the United States and her European allies would agree to work together on reducing dependence, maybe on, uh, you know, on, on accelerated uh, uh, creation of LNG terminals uh, in European ports, um, on, a, on a transatlantic program to bolster Ukrainian uh, gas and, and, and oil uh, uh, supplies to, uh, to reinforce um, alternative supplies for other countries in uh, in Central Europe, etc., and to coordinate at the strategic level uh, across the uh, across the Atlantic uh, in a more intense way uh, than has been the case for the last four years on how best to deal with Russia. So I hope that kind of an energy compact could defuse the Nord Stream two issue. I'll stop here. Uh, if we have a huge agenda coming up beginning in January, uh, and, and I'm, I'm really quite excited about the prospects. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much, Ambassador so uh, 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 Ishinger. Uh, 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 I have some feedback here. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can mute your microphone, oh. Wolfgang. Uh, I just like me also ask Wolfgang to bring up your book to do a bit of, uh, so Wolfgang is just out we didn't, uh, can you see it? Put it in front of your face because I think we, right there you see it. There's a there's a new book by by Wolfgang, so maybe you should put it on your reading list for for uh, for Christmas. I certainly have. Uh, uh, so so thank you so much, uh, Wolfgang, for great remarks. And now I pass the floor to to Ian Brzezinski right away. He, it's in the middle of the night. It's three o'clock uh, or three thirty in the morning. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and you look very fresh for being in the for a true night owl. Thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Oh, thank me. Thank you for including me here in this nippy conference, and it's a great, uh, rare opportunity for me to be able to say good morning, both to any Americans and Europeans at this time of day. And it's a real pleasure and privilege to be on any panel with Ambassador Ischinger. I want to talk about basically two things. Uh, I want to talk about what the elections mean uh, in terms of how they reflect the American outlook on world affairs, and specifically, secondly, what Joe Biden will bring uh, to American foreign policy. Now, foreign policy was not a dominant issue in the 2020 elections here in the United States. And it's very clear that President Trump, the incumbent, and Vice President Biden, uh, the the challenger brought to the table very, very different outlooks on the world, different priorities and different, very different diplomatic styles. And these are manifested in their different approaches on Iran and the JCPOA, climate change, arms control, the pros and cons of alliances and multilateralism. With that said, it's important to recognize the American electorate. We often overlook what the American public thinks and we're a democracy here as you are in, in, in Europe. American public has rarely really been activist on foreign and national security policy, but nonetheless, its outlook on international affairs is decidedly internationalist. And one could even argue has become more so even under the last four years under President Donald Trump. I point to a, a, a Chicago Council on Global Affairs poll that was published in September. And I wanna share some statistics. First, it found that 68% of the American public maintained the United States should take an active part in world affairs. 54% say the US should be more involved, more involved, not less, in addressing the world's problems. And 65% believe globalization is good for the United States. I was stunned by this. 74% said it's actually good for the economy. Globalization is good for the US economy. I was really struck by this because it's often the impression that over the last four years, America has become more nativist. That has not been the case for the American public. Regarding European security, there has also been remarkable agreement and consistency across party lines. 73% say the United States should keep or even boost its commitment to NATO. Two thirds say that NATO benefits the United States as much or even more than its European allies. 50% say if Russia invades a NATO ally, the United States should respond with force. And this attitude towards NATO and transatlantic security cooperation has been reinforced by resolutions and appropriations by the United States Congress. 
Take the case of the European Deterrence Initiative, which provides billions of dollars to the defense of U.S. interests in, in Europe that has been regularly appropriated by the U.S. Congress over the last several years. But there's a warning in these polls, and <laughs> Wolfgang is very sensitive to this. 57% in this poll supported reductions, and I was surprised by this, or full withdrawal of U.S. forces from Germany. And that's a big heads up on burden sharing concerns that permeate the American public's view of our security relationship, the U.S. security relationship with Europe. So Americans recognize the need for U.S. involvement in world affairs and for U.S. leadership abroad. The American public gives their president great license to act in world affairs. And looking forward, it's clear to me that President Joe Biden will exercise that license. So what will he bring to American national security policy? I think he'll have three core priorities. The first is to be refurbish key relationships and, and multilateral institutions that have been strained over the last four years. It's going to want to reaffirm U.S. commitment to NATO's Article 5 responsibilities. It's going to want to realign the U.S.-EU relationship into something that's more cooperational no, rather than confrontational. He wants to get back into multilateral institutions. He's going to be really focusing on countries like Germany and France to make sure our relationships with them are you know, in sync. He'll be doing the same in Asia. A second priority, and this would be a little bit of continuity from the Trump era, is it's going to give real focus on great power competition. He's going to try and divide strategies. He's going to enable the United States to more effectively manage the rise of China and Russia's belligerents. There will be no Russia reset in this administration. We've done that three times. He's not going to do it again. Joe Biden will probably be tougher on Russia than President Obama. His China and Russia policies will also feature a far greater emphasis on multilateralism, coordination with our allies, developing common fronts. And so will the promotion of democracy and human rights. That's the third leg. Joe Biden is a child of the Cold War. He grew up in an era where communism and democracy collided and, and, and competed. That's a mindset that he'll bring to this era. And he does believe that one of the defining features of our world order today is a competition between national authoritarianism and liberal democracy. And he wants to reverse the gains made by the former. So out of the box, when he, after January 20th, when he swears his oath as president, I'd imagine Joe Biden doing the following right out of the box. He's gonna complement his national coronavirus initiative with a, a global um, coronavirus initiative of which Europe will be a key partner. He'll get back into the climate change agreement, as he said, he said on day one. He'll rejoin the World Health Organization on day one. Sometime in the course of this first year, he'll convene a summit of democracies. I imagine his first trips will emphasize community with our European and Asian alliances and allies. And I'm looking at Wolfgang here, and I'm willing to bet, assuming that COVID issues can be handled, that he'll show up at the MSC security forum, the Munich security forums. Just a great opportunity. Well, he loves it. He's been there before. He's enthusiastic about it. And if it's, it's an organization, it's a meeting that facilitates key bilateral engagements. And there's a stone's throw away from Brussels where he could meet with NATO and the EU. He'll probably reverse President Trump's forced posture decisions regarding Germany, but he'll sustain the core rotational deployments that uh, started under Obama and that were increased under President Trump in Central Europe. And there'll be far greater interest in his administration and arms control and expect him to extend the START agreement from right out of the bat. The risk is that I think some of our global allies, and here if you're particularly in Europe, is they'll feel that with Biden, the pressure will be off on them on burden sharing. Expectations in this world, a world of more complex challenges, more urgent challenges, is that we're gonna all have to do more. We're gonna have to do more not only in our respective regions, but globally. I mean, I'm thinking there's going to be pressure on Europe coming from Washington on the alliance's forced posture in Central Europe. It can't be a forced posture that's predominantly a U.S. affair. Our West European allies are going to have to do more with the United States in reinforcing NATO's eastern frontier in North Central Europe and in the Black Sea region. I anticipate sanctions on Russia to become more aggressive. Europeans will need to join in that. China, Wolfgang mentioned China as a real challenge. An effective ch strategy to address the rise of China requires a comprehensive transatlantic strategy 
that leverages not only U.S., but also European political, economic, and military capacities. So a Biden inaugural will be a time for Europe to step up, not step back. Let me close just by mentioning a couple of distinguishing features about Joe Biden as president. He's going to have some significant challenges at home as he tries to drive this, this international agenda forward. He's leading a nation that's division, whose divisions, whose red blue lines have deepened. He faces divisions with his own party between progressives and centrists. And while he may have won decisively both the, among the popular vote in the United States and the Electoral College, it's not clear that his election was so much an endorsement of his leadership as much as rejection of that of Trump. How else to explain the strong performance of the Republican Party in the Senate and its gains in the House of Representatives? So he, has a he faces a potentially challenging transition. This is the news issue of the day. And that has two dimensions. One is tactical, and that's the inconveniences associated with the pre-inaugural transition process. That is, the Trump administration is improperly, uh, unjustly, and uh, unsoundly denying the Trump and the Biden team access to the intelligence papers and the briefings that usually come at this time of the run-up to an inauguration. And second, this is more strategic. There is a possibility that GOP could be significantly controlled by Trump after January 20th, and that could significantly stymie Biden's efforts to appoint and confirm political appointees to his government. That is a real concern. But Biden has two significant assets. First, his foreign policy expertise. He is the most seasoned president-elect since Bush 41 and Nixon when it comes to foreign policy. His advisors are not only seasoned, but they're also collegial. They know how to work together. What I'm trying to say here is that Biden and his team will be able to walk and chew with gum at the same time, push their domestic agenda while at the same time pushing their national security agenda. And then second, Biden brings unmatched understanding and relationships with Congress. He is a man of the Hill. He was Obama's point man to get things done on the Hill. When the Obama administration got anything done involving Congress, usually it was Joe Biden leading the effort. He's got unmatched capacity to manage the congressional dimension of U.S. policy, unmatched since LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, in the 1960s. So with that, he can do a lot to mend the transatlantic relationship, but critical to having success in this realm will be the readiness of Europe to partner with him, not only rhetorically, but also in action. For four years, Europe has had an easy reason to say no to the United States. Now the ball will be back in Europe's court, this will be a time for Europe to step up its ambitions and actions in support of shared transatlantic interests and values. Uh, thank you so much, Ian, for for excellent and pointed remarks. Now we have uh, around uh, 25 minutes or so for a, a discussion and uh, and we have so, uh, so people in the audience might also send questions in and then we, we will bring them to to the speakers and the excellent guests we have here today. But uh, maybe could I ask uh, uh, Ms. Ambassador Ischinger first, do you would would you like to respond or comment upon uh, Ian's remarks? Uh, I think it seems that the two of you agree on quite a bit, but I think that Ian touched upon a very important thing on the on the survey and pub opinion polls. So on the one hand, he indicated that Americans in general seem to be fairly oriented towards international affairs, but at the same time, the US is is a split and divided population now. It's it's polarized. So how what would be your recommendations for European governments in how to deal with a polarized US? Well, first of all, I don't I don't see any fundamental disagreement between uh, the uh, analysis presented by Ian and and his and his prescription, um, and 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 what I what I've said. I totally agree that uh, it would be the worst possible European reaction to the Biden election to now sit back and believe. You know, now, you know, the the tough days with Trump are over 
and now we can sort of lean back and wait for 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 the Americans to come and rescue us each time there is a problem, and we don't need to do anything about it. Uh, that would uh, be a recipe really for disaster because it would reinforce the existing strong, uh, as was just pointed out, um, uh, sentiments in the United States that are not, uh, you know, internationalist or or, or globalist oriented. And we need to uh, play our role in um, trying to demonstrate to these parts of the American electorate uh, that alliances are not only good for us, but also for the United States. Mm. And that uh, there can be equitable burden sharing and there is gains to be to be won uh, from um, coordinating on Russia, on China, on on trade, for example, I think the uh, agreement just concluded in Asia between China and and uh, a very significant number of Asian uh, neighbors is a uh, very very important geostrategic demonstration. We in the transatlantic community should now not sit back, but figure figure out a joint, if it's possible, joint approaches to opening up um, uh, trade agreements and to and to um, uh, and to leverage the immense role that the United States and Europe can play together in international commerce uh, and and investment. Together, we're unbeatable. Uh, we're the largest block, if, if, if that's the correct word. We would be the largest trading block uh, globally. Very hard to beat by anyone if we can get our act together across the Atlantic. Thanks. OK, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I fully agree that it should, it's, it's a bit uh, uh, risky, so to say, if Europeans uh, have this sigh of relief and just sit back and don't do anything. One of the topics that both of you uh, brought up was uh, China and uh, China's relationship and importance also for the future of the transatlantic cooperation. Uh, uh, Ambassador Ishing had touched upon the, the fact that the Europeans have not kind of fully coordinated or the EU has not fully coordinated its China policy. Although there are certain, I would say that Europe is certainly more coordinated now than it was a year ago or two years ago. And there are elements of uh, kind of increased in efforts into integrating, coordinating Europeans around its China policy. But that's just one part of it. The other part is, of course, to Europe to coordinate Europe's China policy to the China policy of the US or how to deal with disputes, differences, etc. So, Ian, how do you see China in and the role of China in the transatlantic, future transatlantic dialogue between the Biden, uh, the Biden administration and the Europeans? I agree with uh, Ambassador Ischinger in that um, I think this will probably be the most difficult uh, discussion that the Biden administration will have with Europe. You know, the, the good news is, is that, uh, you know, in Europe there's been a significant sea change in attitudes towards China. There's far greater concern. The European Union considers China, designate China as a strategic uh, competitor on economic and ideological grounds. Uh, so there's a there's a convergence of, of of opinion across the Atlantic on, you know, and the need to come up with a more comprehensive strategy for dealing with the rise of China, for countering its aggressive dimensions, and for channeling it into a more cooperative or constructive relationship with the transatlantic community. I think that the most difficult discussion will probably come on dimension that, of which this seminar uh, focuses on military power dimension. And, you know, the United States is actively bolstering its force posture in the Pacific region. You know, we have the Defender 2020 exercise in Europe. There's also a Defender 2020 exercise that occurred in the Pacific and will be an annual event. We are doing more there. The military dimension, I think, is going to be the area of greatest difficulty between Europe and the United States. Uh, my, expect, my personal view is that NATO has to play a role in this. 
It doesn't have to be the decisive force in the Pacific, but there has to be some European military skin in the game to ensure that the Chinese see that the United States and Europe are equally committed to all dimensions of engagement uh, in, in, in between China and, and the West. And that's not just political engagement and economic engagement, but also military engagement. And, you know, the sense that I have is that many in Europe would just prefer to deal with the economic side and the political side and leave the military side of the United States. That would be a mistake in two respects. First, it would undercut the effectiveness of, the, of a coordinated transatlantic strategy for China. And then two, it would be a recipe for disengagement of the United States from Europe militarily. Why? Because if the United States is going to focus on China and the Europeans won't be part of that, it will be easy to make the argument that in the United States that you know, if we're going to handle China, we'll let Europe handle Russia on its own. And we don't want to go down that way. That kind of disengagement would be a setback for both Europe and the United States. Mm. Uh, Ambassador Ishing, uh, China uh, would certainly be difficult for Europeans to, because you, some European countries, and certainly Germany, for instance, deeply integrated uh, or really dense ties with, with China economically. So how do you see uh, what Ian said now about you have this economic dimension with China, you have Europeans probably have to kind of look into the economic integration or economic dependency on China and then look at the, at, at the political dimension, maybe human rights, democracy agenda that will come out stronger in, in the Biden and then also to the military dimension. So how do you see this? This will not be easy for Europeans and certainly not for Germans. Um, uh, some, some weeks ago, um, Karen Gonfried, the president of the German Marshall Fund, and I uh, uh, presented a, a, a study, uh, a report, which uh, uh, a, a group of Americans and Europeans had elaborated uh, together. And one of the recommendations of this report, which uh, everybody can find on the German Marshall Fund uh, website, um, was to create a very senior level US European uh, Commission. In fact, we, we proposed that on the American side, such a commission, such a coordinating committee ought to be uh, chaired by, for example, the Vice President of the United States in order to elevate it beyond the level of, you know, either State Department or Defense or so, to have a, a comprehensive approach. And to have uh, on the European side, uh, uh, maybe the President of the EU Commission, uh, together with senior representatives of NATO and, and individual countries, uh, participating in such a, a coordinating, permanent uh, coordinating activity. Now, I think that is in principle a good diplomatic idea, but it doesn't uh, of itself, of course, not resolve the problem that Ian mentioned. What about the military angle? And I do agree that we should certainly uh, uh, engage in NATO and we should, we Europeans should certainly not believe that we can totally abstain from from uh, participating in the in the in the defense or military aspects of uh, the strategic situation in in the Indo-Pacific or in the Asia Pacific region. But you know, let's be honest: uh, the capabilities on the European side to be present in a meaningful, militarily meaningful uh, manner in, in the Asia Pacific are very limited. Uh, the German defense minister just announced the intention, which I applaud. I think this is exact, goes exactly in the direction that Ian uh, uh, just mentioned, announced that we will now, uh, over the course of the next six months or so, deploy a, a German warship, a frigate, uh, to the uh, to to the uh, uh, you know uh, East Asian to the Pacific waters, including the South China Seas, 
That is, of course, you can you can argue that is a symbolic activity, but it is better than nothing, and it is a beginning, and we had never done this before. So things are beginning to change. Don't expect uh, Europeans to show up in, in large and militarily significant numbers in that particular part of the world. But I think we understand that we cannot s simply look the other in the other direction and believe that the United States will happily uh, 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 accept uh, the workload uh, on, on, on their own. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, okay, let's uh, try to move on. And uh, we hear that uh, the two of you are, are in agreement on a lot of issues. But uh, try to tease out some, maybe some diff uh, different views on some topics. Uh, turning to the issue of disarmament, uh, Ambassador Ishinger talked about that he thought maybe the new Biden administration will revigorate uh, uh, disarmament uh, policies and maybe look into the uh, START uh, treaty, etc. So, uh, but at the same time, you Ian said that the Biden administration will be even more, let's say, reluctant to engage with Russia than than the Obama administration, if I understood you correctly. So, how do you view the disarmament policy and what are the prospects for 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 uh, and there's also a question being submitted. Do you think it's realistic that the new star treaty will be extended during the early days? And what will be the future of this disarmament policy? Ian, would you like to make a shot first? Sure. I, I my immediate reaction is is that you know extension of start is low hanging fruit. Uh, that can be done by the president almost by executive action. Uh, it's in the interest of both parties, the United States and Russia. To extend the, the, this agreement, neither country has an interest in unleashing a, you know, another nuclear arms uh, nuclear arms race. Uh, and you know, basically, Putin has signaled an, a readiness to do that. By extending START, doesn't all of a sudden just park uh, strategic nuclear arms control on on the side of the road. It it, it actually buys time that the Biden administration will use to start addressing the other dimensions of strategic arms control that have to be addressed, including the rise of an increasing size of China's strategic nuclear arsenal. So they will go down the same route that that, that Trump uh, tried or, or continues to try um, with strategic nuclear arms control, but with you know some different nuances and a little bit more, more patience. On the conventional side, my gut is that this is, will be an administration, the Biden administration will be one that will be interested in reanimating CFE, if not IMF. But they're going to be clear eyed about this and they're going to be realistic and they're not going to be desperate for a arms control agreement. They're going to be expecting the Russians to show equal interest and also they're going to be very clear that the Russians are going to have to be show determination and commitment to the execution of those agreements. Hmm. So it'll be you know, a revitalization of the arms control agenda but in a, with a, with a pra more pragmatic and realistic edge. Hmm. Uh, uh, Wolfgang, uh, uh, we heard that Biden is uh, concerned about uh, democracy, uh, human rights. He would like to convene, he announced in a paper, I think, in foreign policy uh, or foreign affairs, that he would like to convene a conference on democracy. So this value aspect is really important for, for, uh, for Biden. Now, if you look at Europe, uh, there are some concerns also in Europe about democracy. I'm looking internally in Europe. It's about uh, Hungary, it's about Poland and some other countries. And then also within NATO, we have rather serious stress now in relation to Turkey. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, how do you think uh, Europe should deal with these issues about Hungary, Poland and how will how will the Biden administration kind of support the activities by some West European countries in their policies towards Hungary and Poland, etc. So I'm just talking about kind of whether the, the Biden administration will push for a certain cohesion in Europe also around some of the values or it will promote more European integration around these values. Well, first of all, um, you know, there are a number of countries, not only European, um, Canada, Australia and others, 
uh, that have joined with European uh, governments uh, in 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 this uh, in this uh, so-called alliance for multilateralism. Uh, that is not uh, very different from the idea, as I understand it, that uh, Joe Biden presented, uh, you know, uh, an alliance of democracies or a, or at least a, a, a gathering uh, of democracies. So what I would hope and I think what Europeans hope for is that the United States would again lead in demonstrating the values of democracy, the values of human rights, the value of truth, uh, uh, you know, the value of trust, uh, uh, etc. So the United States can and I hope will uh, take the lead again, uh, and that's good. Second, as far as our our intra-European quarrels about the rule of law, uh, you mentioned uh, Hungary, Poland, uh, uh, etc. You mentioned Turkey, which is a, a partner of the European Union. Here again, I would say the United States, since we're talking uh, transatlantic th things here, the United States can make a huge difference. It makes a difference whether Prime Minister Orban, to give just one example, uh, has the impression that he is the most welcome European leader in Washington. Uh, 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 you know, it makes a difference. And if the if the United States uh, in their uh, discussions with European leaders demonst uh, demonstrates a a preference for, uh, you know, for adhering to uh, the rule of law, to uh, fundamental human rights, including, by the way, uh, you know, the, the freedom for uh, for example, for homosexuals, that is uh, across Europe now an agreed fundamental right, which is which is uh, being questioned uh, in in one or two or three member countries. Uh, so I think the 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 Biden administration can make it can be extremely helpful in uh, helping the European Union to um, uh, um, to um, win this internal fight about uh, to what extent the rule of law needs to be uh, upheld. As far as Turkey is concerned, I would say the same thing. Hmm. It's, it is unfortunately difficult for the European Union uh, to uh, engage with Turkey in a way that impresses President Erdogan much. But if we were able to show up together in Ankara, the United States with a strong commitment to uh, the alliance, but also with a strong commitment to uh, a strong relationship between Turkey and the European Union, that uh, that would, as far as I can tell from my point of view, that would be uh, most appreciated in European capitals. So, you know, uh, what we have not had for the last uh, several years was uh, American leadership in European matters, and um, uh, th th that was too bad. Uh, my my uh, wonderful friend Richard Holbrook, who passed away unfortunately a few years ago, um, wrote an article in Foreign Affairs some 30 years ago, almost in the early 90s, um, with the title "America as a European Power." And I think we have benefited over the last five, six, almost seven decades from America defining itself, not only, but also as a power present in Europe. Uh, and I think we would, we would welcome a return of America as a power present in Europe, uh, not only militarily, but also politically, with the values aspect uh, as, very, as a very important element. Let me pick up on what uh, uh, Wolfgang just said, uh, Ian. Um, as, so, as you have observed, a lot of or some European leaders have talked recently about this notion about Euro European sovereignty, European uh, strategic autonomy, and there's uh, these efforts to kind of bring together 
and ensure a bit more integration in Europe about foreign and security policy and also defense policy. Some have seen this as a way of making an, uh, moving away from transatlantic cooperation. And then some others argued that now this is not moving away from transatlantic cooperation. This is to make Europe a stronger partner, more trustworthy and credible partner to the US. Uh, how do you see, how should Europe kind of work in order to, to, to ensure both European integration and stronger transatlantic ties? And there is a small footnote here because in maybe in, in just six weeks time, the UK will leave the EU, also the transition period will end. So uh, uh, the US will also have, they have this special relationship with the Brits. So how do you see the Biden administration playing? Will, how will they relate to Europe? Will they re relate primarily through the capitals to uh, Germany and France? You mentioned them. You didn't mention the UK in your introduction, Ian, that's interesting. Uh, so uh, how, how, what is Europe looking like from, from the Biden perspective? Is it Germany and France? Is it the EU or is it the UK? Well, also, let me just throw on a couple of points about the democracy because I was struck by Wolfgang's um, comments and we're very much in sync. I, I just want to underscore that democracy promotion, not just defensive democracy, but democracy promotion is going to be a driving pillar of uh, the, the Biden foreign policy. I mean, as I mentioned in my remarks, you know, he really reg regards the collision between national, author national authoritarianism and liberal democracy to be one of the defining features of our world order, one of the key challenges before us. And he sees the protection and the promotion of democracy as critical to the reestablishment, uh, the refurbishment, the reinforcement of the liberal international order that has been so key to the peace and prosperity that have defined uh, world affairs since since the end of World War II. So that's going to be high on on the on the list. And you know this is a, this emphasis is very McCain-like. I can see Senator McCain up in the heavens looking down, smiling on this because he talked a lot about a community of democracies. And the community of democracies, in which the United States is part of, it, is going to be a community of democracy that features as its core the transatlantic community. And so this is going to be an area, I think, with rich opportunity for the United States and Europe to do more together looking forward. On ESDP, I've always been a bit of an ESDP skeptic. Um, I've always been worried that language like strategic autonomy is akin to kind of at least signals, you know, a, a desire to be distant from the United States, separate from the United States, unencumbered by the United States. And I really think it's important for Europeans from a transatlantic perspective to focus their military ambitions, to focus their military resources through the venues of the transatlantic alliance, NATO. Mm. Uh, because that has proven over the last decades to be the most, well, it's been history's most success, successive military alliance. It is the institution that is best prepared to deal not only with the challenges that Europe finds in its immediate periphery, but then challenge that we're dealing with globally. And we see that through NATO operations, not only defending its immediate frontiers, but also international and complex operations like in Afghanistan and counterterrorism. So for me, you know, strategic autonomy is more of a theory. I have never really seen how it's been manifested. I do see uh, a proven track record of success for transatlantic cooperation, for the development of European military capabilities through NATO. And for this reason, it's only logical for me as an American to want to encourage NATO, excuse me, Europe, to focus on NATO uh, as a primary, you know, conduit for its multilateral military ambitions. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. We see the run, we're running out of time. So, uh, Wolfgang, uh, uh, thank you so much. But could I ask you just one a uh, final question before you log off. Uh, and and you said something very interesting about the energy security compact. Uh, prospect of US LNG. You know, Norway provides also around 30% of the gas to, to Europe. Um, so this is very interesting also, of course, for, for Norway. Uh, and this relates also in some sense to, to the climate policy and the transatlantic uh, 
cooperation on climate policy. But by listening to you, do you mean that Germany now should terminate the Nord Stream 2 initiative? Is that what you said? Uh, no, I don't think that uh, stopping the project uh, sort of five minutes before it's completed is not exactly, you know, the best possible decision. Um, I would agree that maybe we shouldn't have started it, uh, uh, you know, a number of years ago. Um, but what I'm suggesting is the following, you know, during my during, uh, I'll be very brief, during my ambassadorial tour in the United States, the Secretary of Defense was Don Rumsfeld. And Don Rumsfeld had this very interesting uh, 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 sentence, which he uh, repeated in my presence a couple of times. Uh, if you don't know how to solve a problem, enlarge it. So I think if it's if it turns out that this Nord Stream 2 problem, which if, if you regard it as a German, you know, uh, American problem, can we enlarge it and 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 can can we uh, place it in the context of a larger transatlantic energy policy agreement, which we have not had in the past? We have had fragments of it here and there, and not even the European Union had authority. Uh, in energy security, it was regarded generally as a as an as a national prerogative. That is wrong because if you want a comprehensive EU foreign policy, you you can you cannot keep energy foreign policy out of it. So the German idea that uh, Nord Stream two, you know, is a German project, a business project, and uh, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, European. Uh, uh, security and foreign policy. That was, of course, in my view, somewhat short-sighted, and uh, uh, and we should draw the consequences of this. So what I'm su suggesting is that for the future, we create a, a significant transatlantic framework to reduce dependencies collectively, not only for Germany, uh, but for a number of Central and Eastern European countries, which are some of them are even more dependent than we are on, uh, as we speak, on Russian oil and gas. Um, and we could um, uh, uh, we could invest money. Uh, we could um, help Ukraine uh, modernize its, uh, its 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 infrastructure, etc., etc., etc. So I see a lot of potential gains, and I, I would I would also see a good way of getting rid of the transatlantic tensions over Nord Stream if we demonstrate that we are not in the business of accepting American security help to defend against uh, Russian aggression in Europe and uh, at the same time uh, continuing to, um, you know, to regard Russia as the principal supplier of our energy. That is not a very good fit, I would be the first to admit. Mm. Okay, thank you so much. I see time is running out and I know that you're very busy. So. I would just like to thank the, uh, take this opportunity to thank the two of you, Wolfgang Ischinger for excellent remarks and Ian Brzezinski, full of energy in the middle of the night uh, coming across. And, and I think that uh, Wolfgang said it very nicely that there's a lot of enthusiasm, but curb your enthusiasm. And I, uh, one message that came out very clearly from the two of you is that we cannot kind of assume that the transatlantic relationship will kind of immediately be smooth and fast running. We have to work on to make it strategically important in our time. And that, that's not an easy job. It's not sitting back. It's hard work. And I think the two of you have done excellent work also to indicate some elements to that agenda and also possibly sketch out some uh, avenues where we, we might see this unfolding. So. Thank you so much to the, to, to the two of you.